Welcome to the Hearthstone Deck Tech Podcast. You are listening to Season 2, Episode 4, King's Bane Rogue with Danny Donuts. Welcome everyone to another episode of Hearthstone Deck Tech Podcast where we discuss all the newest decks out there and different uh, nuances and ways to adjust and play those decks. Um, today we have a very special guest. Um, you know, for the past three weeks, we've looked at people, players who really involved in the ladder. Um, and my guest today is involved in the ladder, has had many um, number one finishes in Wild. Uh, he's a member of Team One Trick. He does the Into the Wild podcast as well as the Well Met podcast and a nu- numerous other like offerings to the Wild community. Um, and he's Danny Donuts. So, Danny, welcome to the show. Hey, hey, thanks for having me on, Ken. No, you know, thank you for coming on, man. You know, like I, I, I this is the second season of the podcast. Um, the first season was pretty likely. I just did the podcast because, like, you know, I like to talk about the game, and you know, I don't care. Like, if there's 500 people who listen to it, or there's four people who listen to it, I, re- I really don't care. I just, I just like to make content for the game. And then, um, I got involved with season one of Into the Wild, the league. And I thought it was really cool. And the first game, yeah, you were casting in that. That was uh, you. So I mean, and uh, oh know, man, I pulled out so many shenanigans in that. It was amazing, <laughs> man. I it was amazing. I got to cast two of your matches with with opponents, and um, you know the decks you brought were always they're always fun and they're always cool. But really, the one thing that stood out to me this whole time, and I you know I didn't know at the time that you know you won the Into the Wild or the F two K controls wild invitational or you know how good of a wild player you're you're you were i at the time i'm just like okay here's a guy danny donuts plays wild and then i just was really amazed with your decision making like how much forethought you had uh in terms of um how were you how you were preparing to win matches i like one of the moments that really stuck out to me was uh you were challenging um maybe jonah raw or someone and you had like reno mage or something and you played the Antonitis early, got three or four fireballs, ticked them down, and then, you know, kept his life and then burned him out, by yeah. down to like 33 or something and burned him out with those three off after top decking the one mana Maligos, right? And like, I, yeah. you know, I knew at that point, I was like, man, this guy really played to the outs, you know, like he knew he used the Luna's Galaxy to, to discount his, uh, his creatures at that point, And he really, uh, you know, just played extremely well because i think of a one turn later you're probably dead uh, on board there but mm-hmm. it's pretty amazing so i'm i'm very glad to have you on a, uh, on the show and I, I was just hoping maybe you could tell the viewers a little bit more about your hearthstone journey how you got started uh what your passions are in the game and you know where you're at now with the game yeah totally so uh like i said like ken said i'm denny donuts um, I started uh, back when I was in college. I played a couple of my friends introduced me to the game, and like I, I played uh, through at, at the start of beta, but I didn't really get serious up until maybe like I don't know, uh, right when it Whispers of the Old Gods dropped, and that was the distinction between like when Wild and Standard really split. And at that point, I was like, okay, well. I would. I had just started making a couple articles here and there. I wrote for BlizzPro.com for a little bit, and I, I felt that like there were so many content creators in Hearthstone that I wanted to find my own niche. So Wild ended up being that niche for me, and I start because I really like the old cards. I like the Sludge Belcher, the Mad Scientist, Nerubian Egg, all those cards that were rotating out, and like I I tried to take advantage of being one of the only content creators in that uh, position. And I mean, uh, I got in on the ground floor on a lot of the wild Hearthstone organizations. Um, like I'm a moderator on their on the R Hearthstone subreddit on the Discord, um, and I have a lot of other things that I've done throughout my time. I've helped found the Wild VS Meta Report. Uh, I was the lead writer there for a while. Um, I became the lead writer of the Tempo Storm Meta Snapshot. Um, I also create YouTube videos for them as well. Um, and then, like uh, like Ken said, I play ladder. I've gotten a couple one finishes. Um, 
gone through, played in a bunch of tournaments, uh, qualified for the Wild Open this year. Didn't make it all the way through, but uh, my friend Dr. J made it through. So I'm glad that he got through and had a good time in there. But uh, yeah, so I, I, anything that's happened with Wilds, um, I've at least spectated it, if not been a part of it. Uh, I really enjoyed growing the format from its start to where it is now because in the beginning it was very very grassroots and it's still in that form right now but i think we've gotten to a point where there's a little bit of meat behind the bones of uh the wild format and we can start uh holding our own at this point you know i i totally agree i think that's really funny um i think when the grandmasters uh, like uh season or when they started introducing grandmasters as the the mode at which they would handle competitive Hearthstone, I I really feel like a lot of players started gravitating towards uh, Wild as a format simply because the community at Wild um, pr produces their own incentives to play in that format, right? With uh, various tournaments, mm -hmm. um, you know, and with a more traditional uh, style of format, and um, I I can see a lot of players who like go back and forth like guys like sippy Wee and meaty um who probably started in wild i know sippy Wee started where he played pro mm -hmm. uh, predominantly in wild moved over to standard but now have found their way back home into wild right you know messing with different types of archetypes uh in wild so i i think that's really good to see what is your maybe like proudest moment in hearthstone was it hitting a certain rank or beating a certain player or maybe achieving something with uh, an event that you threw or participated in? So, man, there, there are a ton of them. Um, but the, the the one that really stands out to me, was it this December? It wasn't this December. It was the December before, December 2017. Um, that was the season. The, the latter was back in the old format where you got reset all the way back yeah. down to 15. Yeah. Um, and that season, uh, I was the first person to hit legend. So I, we did a rat race essentially for wild, a bunch of the wild players slizzle through it. And we had a bunch of people going up there. And I remember it was Jonah Ra and me, and we played maybe, I don't know, 20 pirate warrior mirror matches in a row. Oh. <laughs> it was, it was kind of crazy. Because we were the only, because we were at uh, at that yeah, point, I think we were like rank five oh. and like everyone else was like rank 10 or below. Wow. So that it was crazy. And I, I remember that I played Pirate Warrior, uh, Reno Priest, and then like Big Druid back then where you just ramped out and played big things. So uh, I got rank one there and I think I held rank one for, I want to say 15 or 16 days. Like I, I competitively stayed on that spot. So uh, I felt really good about that one. That's probably my biggest like achievement achievement besides the events that I've played in. But like, like you said, the controls tournament uh, qualifying for the wild open. But I think that that one season really stands out to me. Uh, you know, what do you, I, it's really more common in wild to like queue up into the same opponent, like multiple times, like, Especially the, the higher rank you are, yeah. Uh, you tend to get so that's that a the, lot. yeah. That I mean, I I think that's part of the small player base, and I mean, it's it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? Where you can start, you start getting very familiar with other players. Where let's say you run to the same person today, and then tomorrow someone's going to be at the same rank because they're still playing the game. So I'm like, oh, X Crouton, he always plays Reno Warlock. Okay, I'll know that. So you get a little bit more advantage on players because you know what they tend to like play when you're playing against them. But I mean, it also leads to the counter queuing issue where if I'm running into the same person again and again, all of a sudden they can switch decks to try to counter my deck. And then at that point you have to think about, all right, do I need to go in and switch decks? Do, like it, it becomes a metagame in itself where if you're really trying to grind super hard for those top legend points, like it becomes a mind game where it's like, okay, he's going to counter cue me if I cue into him again. So I need to switch decks to something that beats like the deck that beats this deck. And if you're really going in to be competitive in wild, that's something you need. I mean, this is only for the top, uh, for like the top edge of legend at this point. But I mean, it became a thing when ladder really got shifted up that it really, um, it really trickled its way back up. But for a while it was like, once you got to rank five, you had to start paying attention to that when you had the full ladder yeah. system. 
But at this point, like, I mean, you won't run to the same person more than twice in a row in, um, in like below top 30 legend. What are you, what are your, some of your favorite archetypes? To play? You know, I, you made the star aligner druid deck, right? Would you say that you were one yep. of the pioneers? Of yeah, I was, yeah, I was one of the people who really started out with that deck. Um, I, I was one of the people who refined the giants warlock deck, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm kind of like when I see something that's broken, I try to innovate a little bit with it because a lot of times in wild, someone will come up with a really cool idea, but it takes a little bit for the idea to get completely like refined. So if I find something that someone, some streamers playing or that like I see online, I, I try to go through and add in some of the synergistic cards from some of the old sets. And like like your question, what's my favorite archetype? Well, my favorite archetype is Reno Priest. And I say Reno Priest, a lot of the standard players are going to be like, oh no, that was Razakis Priest. But it was a completely different deck in Wild where you obviously had Reno. So a lot of the aggro matchups were tended to be a little bit more towards you. But back in that vein of putting in cards that were very synergistic from like some of the older sets, you have a Spawn of Shadows, which is a card that I mean, was never played in TGT when it came out. But like when you all of a sudden you have a deck that does a lot of hero powers, all of a sudden the, it becomes just a giant burn card. And I found that really cool. I like that aspect of Wild the best. Wild is like a deck builder's paradise where you can go through and essentially make any deck teched against any situation. I really like that about the format. Yeah, I, I mean, it's true. And Wild just... There's just so many cards, and so many of the old cards are like, there's so many cards that are always unplayed. Like in a standard season, it's just, it doesn't have the cards, the, the other card support, or maybe it's just burned out by other options. But when combined with like another pair of cards two years later, mm -hmm. or another bunch of sets, like it comes back into relevance. And I always thought that that's what's interesting about Wild, because I mean, man, you want to play broken cards because they're broken. And, you know, it, like Aviana Kun, that's my favorite comp. Starline of Druid, we're going to be. I did like three episodes of talking um, in my first season of the podcast talking about Starline and Druid <laughs> because it was just so fun. Like to me, it was incredibly yeah. broken, powerful, um, but it had a really efficient line of gameplay. You know, the way it curved out and the way you're using Juicy Psych Melon to, to get into your combo pieces and how you can move, so, play the order of your combo pieces differently to achieve different things and win in different matchups. And I. You know, like keeping a brand and a Lotheb to play around a brawl or a psychic scream or something, something crazy, right? And, and find your your win conditions that way. And I and I really, man, I, honestly, I'm so glad that you created the the deck list and that we're talking about it today because, um, yeah, it's just one of my favorite decks of all time. Do you do you play standard? On occasion, I'll I'll hit Legend and Standard once or twice a year, but like I'll I'll play a couple games here and there. I don't really play too too much in Standard. Uh, I just do it more or less to get the general feel of it for my for uh, when I'm on Well Met, mm -hmm. because a lot of the times Jr. and Ray talk a lot about Standard, and I want to have a grasp on what they're talking about. So like I know that right now Rogue is very strong, but I think that it's actually a real uh, benefit for me. A lot of Wild players exclusively play Wild, mm -hmm. and my exposure to Standard has really helped me out in certain cir circumstances where someone will have a Wild deck, and then all of a sudden, like Standard's teching a specific way because of the new cards, and people haven't really tried out the new cards in like some of the older decks. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that I like to do. Where like when Mech Mage came, uh, uh, bringing back Mech Mage when certain cards were released back into the meta. That's something that I've done in the recent past, maybe Boomsday or so. So, like, trying out different cards when in, like, old builds of decks is something that's really cool to do as well. Um, you know, when you first started playing, what or what was the point in your Hearthstone experience that things clicked for you and achieving uh, higher Legend finishes or even just Legend became... Uh, much simpler task, you know, because I, you know, I, I know starting out, at least for me, like I was like, oh, I, I, I want to hit legend. That's my goal. I, I really want to get legend, you know. Um, and then over mm -hmm. time, like once you hit it a few times, like you know, maybe your goals change. Like, well, you know, what was that point where things started clicking from you, and and what changed, uh, 
in your outlook towards the game to help you achieve that kind of higher play? Well, for me, I remember that there was, I remember I was in college when I hit Legend for the first time, I think it was my sophomore or my junior year. And uh, the big issue that I had was that studying was something uh, like I couldn't balance hitting Legend and my in my studies and going to school. Um, so like I hit it once or twice in that first period. And then once I had graduated and I was working, I had a little bit more free time. Um, I felt that being able, essentially I had to just go and set my goals to a appropriate level. In the beginning, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to hit legend every season. And then like a certain season I would have, I'd be like, okay, this season I want to hit legend and I'd really have to try at it. And then I, I'd either get there or I wouldn't in the early days. But I really think that after, I think just getting a general understanding of a lot of the cards and a lot of the concepts of the game, not necessarily just how to play a specific deck, but more macro on specific game archetype decisions where you're like, okay, I'm playing a druid against a rogue. Rogue is going to have these types of finishers. So as a druid, I need to go and set things up ahead of time so that when they do draw these specific cards, I'm going to be set ahead of time so that I don't have to deal with these threats at, like when they come out. And I'm not surprised by these cards as they're played. So I think thinking more, at a, when I started transitioning from the micro level, from like, okay, what do I trade? What do I do with this? To more of the big picture level, I think that's when it really started. I mean, there are some matchups that it doesn't really matter. When you're playing like an uh, when you're playing a um, an aggro mirror, it's all about the micro decisions. It's like, do I trade here? Do I go face? But in certain matchups, uh, the, this is my this is my go to example back in the day. I used to be play a ton of Reno Priest, and uh, the one of the matchups that a lot of people didn't really understand how to play was against Reno Mage. Everyone thought Reno Mage was incredibly favored. You didn't, you weren't able to beat it. But I was one of the people who really started teaching the Wild community. Okay, now Reno Priest actually is able to win, but you have to play from a specific mindset. You have to go through and uh, essentially pop their block when their Reno isn't active, and you're able to do that by psychic screaming minions into their deck or you're able to go through and pop their block before you use your spawn of shadows so that when they reno immediately after you're able to go in and kill them with a bunch of spawn of shadows hit so thinking at that like large like micro macro level rather than okay i have this minion on this turn let me play it i think that broadening your thought process to each game to what do i have to do to win this game uh am i the beat down am i am the control deck am, am i a combo deck what do i have to do to get my combo does my combo even work anymore I, one of the things that i find people also don't do too well is recognizing when their combo is burnt or like you can win without having to use your combo like in the example you gave earlier when uh i realized that i had to go and i was going to lose on board against uh I think it might have been Bananaramic uh, with the mage deck, that I, the Exodia mage, and I ended up having to generate the fireballs early and then burn them out from these areas. And I'm like, okay, he's at 30. If he plays his Death Knight, he goes to 35. I have to ping him twice because I only have 33 damage in my hand. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, it's incredible. Incredible for, uh, foresight, and especially in that game. I certainly didn't see that. I was like, oh, okay, I just ping the face damage. Maybe the that damage is useless on board and just trying to get what he can but i mm -hmm. mean exact 33 damage and that was a great that was a great um uh example um mm -hmm. two more questions one question is like when you, when the season starts what what helps you decide what decks you're gonna play like you know i know sometimes the meta can shape the decisions of what you end up playing at a certain rank but when starting off um like how do you decide like what what are you you know gravitating towards playing most of the time so a lot of the time i feel that it's more or less uh, it depends on if i'm really trying to like try hard that season or if i'm just casually playing hearthstone mm -hmm. if i'm really trying to like accomplish something and go really far uh, I'm going to go and try to look at as much data as I can. I'll look at the Tempo Storm meta snapshot. I'll look at the VS meta snapshot. 
I'll go through, gather as much data, look at what the best decks are. And then I'll go in and say, am I a good pilot at any of these decks or am I a good pilot at something that counters these decks? And then from there, uh, I, I'll play something that I'm good at. Um, if I start losing a lot with a deck, like if I get three or four or five losses in a row, um, because I have the wild, because I'm in wild, the meta um, is fairly stagnant at a specific point. But when you go from one point to the next one, it can change drastically. So if I'm losing five games in a row, like in my current meta, I need to adapt to it. So do I need to add any tech cards into my deck? Do I need to go in and essentially figure out what? Why am I losing those games? Is why uh, what I need to look at. I think that's something that players don't really recognize as much. Uh, a lot of the times people, they'll go and they'll complain, oh, I missed the top deck, I was unlucky. I feel that a lot of the time, uh, I mean, you need to know like how matchups are, and you're like, oh, well, this that was a 60-40 favored deck in, in my favor, and I lost. Why did I lose that game? And then you can look in and look at some of your plays. And I find a lot of the time with me, when I lose games, it's my fault. It's something that I did wrong or uh, like I, I didn't plan for something ahead of time or maybe I didn't play the right tech card or something along those lines. So I think that analyzing your games is something that you should definitely do if you're really trying to go really far. Great, great. Um, so, you know, what what do you hope happens with the wild uh, format uh, in the future of the game? And what are your plans for the future of Hearthstone, like what are what are you going to continue to do? Um, are you going to stop playing? What 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 does the future hold for Danny Donuts in terms of Hearthstone? Uh, there's no stopping anytime soon for me. Um, I mean, I I think that uh, as time goes on and life goes on, I I may start drifting away from the game, but I don't think I'm ever going to leave Hearthstone. Um, I think that for the Wild format, I just want it to be incorporated as a part of whatever the most competitive Hearthstone scene is. That's why I'm a member of Team One Trick. That's why we throw the Wild Ladder Challenge every uh, quarter or so, where we're able to go through and essentially show off uh, the the best of the best for competitive in Wild, the people in Wild format. Um, I think that uh, I just want to see Wild go down a competitive route, where the people who have put time and effort into the format are rewarded for the effort that they put into it. You know, I agree. I, I definitely hope that comes to fruition more, at least from a Blizzard support standpoint, because I know you guys at One Trick are doing so much with the format. And I mean, really, they're like, and it just really, that whole community is carried on the shoulders of this small core group of guys, you, you know, yourself and guys like you who, you know, do things like the Into the Wild League. Uh, you know, the Invitational, Wild Invitationals, the Wild Opens, these you know, these relatively pretty grand scale types of events uh, cater towards that type of format. And really, um, without it, it just would be very hard to get any type of exposure of, you know, the brilliant um, players that are in that format and the deck list that they bring. And uh, today we have something that's very traditional, but it has a mix of I guess the new, and I, you know, I, I know you alluded to it a little bit about like, you know, your play in standard helps you show, uh, you know, certain things that stand out in that format and how you can use that to um, uh, adjust to your gameplay in wild. So we have a deck list on the screen for those of you watching on YouTube, but if you're not, I'll just read it through if you're watching or if you're just listening to the podcast. It's uh, two counterfeit coins, two preps, two buccaneers, two deadly poison, one Kingsbane, one patches, two South Sea deckhand, uh, two Cavern Shining Finder, two Saps, two Ships Cannon, Edwin Van Cleef, two Evil Miscreants, two Raiding Parties, two Dread Corsairs, two Naga Corsairs, two Tinker Sharp Sword, a Sharp Sword Oil, and one My Myra's Unstable Element. And uh, so we got a Kingsbane list today, guys. Uh, Kingsbane, it's just got it's got a great wild history, right? Kingsbane is a uh, uh, typically a, day, a deck that's really po polarizing and the way people see it, they either really like it or they really hate it. Um, but this deck is a little more intuitive and different in that you'll see that it has a Evil Miscreant. And, uh, you know, actually last season I played a lot of Kingsbane Road and I had an incredibly simple climb to like rank one. But then I ran into Slizzle and only Odd Paladins 
for like two weeks and i the matchup was it's winnable but it's pretty difficult like i you know if they secure that board and you can't um create a a big enough tempo board you kind of lose and so when i was testing danny's deck i realized like wow uh evil miscreant really does do a lot it's like playing rogue and standard and it really oh, does yeah. help fight for that board and that matchup which i would say was probably i don't know 65 35 previously is a lot closer to 50 percent like now so i mean mm -hmm. danny you know if you can talk just a little bit about this deck that you created and, and what yeah how totally it differs from ki typical kingsbane rogue and why why you made those changes yeah oh definitely so kingsbane rogue has been traditionally the strongest deck for the past two or three months um in wild but the the one thing that i really started to see and this is this may be because i'm looking over at standard a little bit is that in in standard rogue is also very strong but because of different things because of the waggle pick and like the edwin turns and uh, i mean i've been watching some of these specialist tournaments when people are teching in cards like wisp and i'm like well as soon as you start teching in wisp into a deck like you know that these combo effects from miscreant from all the other things in the deck are have to be really strong so having a little bit of a pulse on the standard format i'm like well if i'm trying to get these combo effects in wild i just have better cards that i could be putting in like counterfeit coin in my mind was my wisp that i'm putting into uh my deck i'm like oh well i want to get some combo on these raiding parties uh i, I i'll get a coin and i'll get out a turn earlier and it's a lot a lot better but I felt that Miscreant is very good for a lot of these tempo board matchups. Because um, a lot of the times with Kingsbane Rogue, you're a bit of a glass cannon, where if you're playing up against a control deck, like they're not going to be able to put enough pressure on you to kill you in time. But it seems that the meta is really starting to turn so that uh, a lot of the decks that you're playing against are either Kingsbane, anti kingsbane aggro or control and like that's the rocks paper scissors of wild right now and the anti um the anti kingsbane control decks like paladin like zoo like aggro druid have really started to pick up a bit so uh, i was feeling that kingsbane wasn't in as good of a spot as it was before but i was like we have a toolkit that where we can add a lot of things that can go in and uh, essentially shore up some of those weak spots that you have so the, the counterfeit coins, the Edwin was something that hadn't been run for a while. And then after watching, uh, <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate, after, after watching Ray lose in the semifinals to Firebat in one of the tournaments that he was playing in, like I was like, oh, wow, I, I forgot how good Edwin was. And I'm like, why are we not running it in this deck? And uh, with the addition of the Evil Miscreant, like now all of a sudden you have a bunch of one drops that you're playing. You have counterfeit coins, you have preps, like you can get big end wins early and just win games. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, can you talk a little bit about what matchups you'd like to see? And well, I mean, I guess you you did talk you, like typically Kingsbane doesn't want to face the anti-aggressive aggro decks. But uh... yeah, so so the main thing that I this mat this deck is teched extremely strong against the mirror. Because you're able to get these combo cards off, because you have Miscreant, you're able to fight for board quicker. Like, this is the Kingsbane... Like, if you're playing up against someone with a normal Kingsbane list, like the stock list that was up on... The meta reports haven't come out recently, but if, the, if you go to the most recent Tempo Storm one, or the most recent, like, Vicious Syndicate report list, this one, as of right now, like halfway through the month, is going to beat that deck. It's going to have an edge. So, because the deck that I took this from is the specialist deck that's teched to beat rogue as rogue. Uh -huh. So I think that you're, you're good against Kingsbane rogue, which is going to be a good amount of the field. You are, uh, I don't want to say 50, 50 against some of these aggro decks. You're probably going to lose a lot more to paladin and druid, especially odd paladin. That's going to be like the, the pain in your butt, but it's, it's like a 40, 45% win rate against that as opposed to like the, they're probably 75, 25 when you're playing without this. Yeah. And then, I, I mean, I think that you're not really losing much against control decks. I mean, especially, uh, you, sometimes you're even more uh, advantaged because you're able to go out and play an Edwin on, like, turn two or three, and if your opponent doesn't have whatever clear option they have, 
Like you can just smash them in the face a bunch of times. No, yeah, definitely. Um, what are what what are some typical mulligan strategies for certain archetypes in general? Like you know, against a aggro mirror or you know, against sure. Control. So uh, maybe not necessarily about uh, per archetypes, but there are some mulliganing things that are counterintuitive. That if you haven't played an aggressive pirate deck with ship's cannon for a really long time, if you haven't played one in a while or ever, there are a couple things that are counterintuitive. And I think this really is like more of that macro level game plan that I was talking about. But if you ever have like ship's cannon and a pirate, a lot of the times people in wild will like the, the, the traditional play is you play the ship's cannon on two and then you wait and then turn three, like you play a pirate behind it. But that is wrong. You want to be saving the cannon and the pirate for turn three. So the so that's one thing that you need to think about when you're playing the deck because the ship's cannon is like there's no real reason to put it out on board where your opponent can remove it and then you also get the immediate you're really playing it for the board control value because you're getting the two pings from the pirate and then from patches that comes out as well so you you're not that disappointed if your opponent plays some minions out into that because you're essentially taking the board over from that and you're gonna have a huge tempo swing um other mulligan things uh i mean you always keep prep that's something that you might not think about but prep is just one of the most essential cards in this deck uh it allows you to get out early um Tinker Sharp Sword oils. Uh, it lets you get to Myra's because you're going to run out of your cards really early. Um, and one of my earlier variants of this deck, I was actually running Jeeves for card draw. Um, and I, this that, that was the version that Concerned Mom and I took to the Wild Open uh, about two or three, what was that, three months ago at this point? Um, so, but we, Jeeves was like the card draw, an extra card draw that you want. You're really lacking cards in this deck. So having that prep to hit into a raiding party early or into a Myra's is really, really good. But it's also, you don't need to play it to get the discount on spells. If it's turn three and you have a miscreant in hand at a prep and no other spells, prepping out the miscreant is something that is definitely really good because you're able to generate tempo off the lackeys. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, I don't know, I think that a lot of the times, you don't really want to be keeping a lot of the really big minions, um, but against, like, control decks, uh, I occasionally find myself keeping sap a little bit more than I should at this point. Mm -hmm. I think that you should be keeping sap, but I might be going a little bit, I'm trying to figure out if I'm taking it a little bit too much, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going too heavy into it. I think I'm right against like big priest you want to keep a one copy of sap because your opponent's not going to be able to get a minion out until turn four uh, with barns and then you just t uh flick away the token right or if you have to wait till turn six then you're winning the game in the next turn yeah so uh, i think sap against control matchups is something that people might not intuitively keep um and then yeah, against aggro just keeping prep is really good uh prep uh like, turn one, the best play you have is prep raiding party. Yeah. But you also, like, don't throw away a ship's cannon in the aggro matchups because those matchups, while you are, like, a burn deck and you're going to eventually kill your opponent by hitting them in the face with your weapon, you're fighting for board for turns one through four, one through five. So being able to recognize that you need to fight for board rather than I'm just going to immediately start throwing everything face is something that's very uh, noteworthy about the deck. You know, uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, holding the ship's cannon and the pirate for turn three is something that for mm -hmm. new players is kind of counterintuitive. You don't really think about because, you know, you're thinking to just get on board as early as possible and play cards on curve. Are there any other types of decision-making plays over the course of the game that you think new players typically mistake for being the right play, but it's typically maybe the wrong play, or they have another line of play that they could go into? Um, I think Myra's in early. Mm. I think that's something that people might not take advantage of. A lot of times people wait until they've wasted all of their cards, until they've played everything before you Myra's. I think sometimes, uh, I think th this is all dependent on if you have Kingsbane or not. If you have Kingsbane and you might have one or two weapon buffs on it already, 
I think Myrazing, when you have three or four cards in your hand, is good. I think that's a good play because you have the consistency of being able to, towards the later part of the game, being able to dagger and then consistently stop fatigue through that. So I think that that is one thing that people might be a little bit um, hesitant to do. You wait until you've played all your cards out and then you play Myra's. I think that a lot of the times playing Myra's to get all these cards, all these options in your hand is actually a little bit better. Now, don't go ahead. Uh, one of the things that you typically want to do, um, one, of the, one, of the wor- one of the worst things you can do is Myra's when you don't have King's Bane equipped. Unless you're going for lethal, and that's one of the things that this deck is lacking. The the cards that I cut to put in these counterfeit coins and the lackeys and Edwin was eviscerate. Yeah, eviscerate. So you're lacking a little bit of burst, and that's one of the things that you're typically doing when you're play when, when you're playing this version of the deck. You need to understand what burn you have potentially left in your deck, and you can't just go Myra's. Oh, I'll hit like some extra burst damage you need to know exactly what you're going to hit and because of that i find that you want to typically have your king's bane so sometimes i'll even hold on to my myras when i don't have my king's bane because if i don't hit my king's bane i lose on the spot right great you know actually i didn't even think about how you could just keep daggering and putting myras on the top of the deck when you're in fatigue ready i i've actually never made that play and i realized that i've probably used myras quite a few times already and and haven't done that and it's so simple Mm -hmm. um you know, I, you know the one card that I I think uh, that I miss once in a while, I guess, is Lotheb. Um, what do you think mm-hmm. is yeah, the twenty ninth and thirtieth slot in the deck that are are the most flexible? Yeah. So right now, the cards that I think are the most flexible to tune to whatever matchup you're going against are the counterfeit coins and the Edwin. I think that those three cards are what I'm teching in right now for the tempo-based board aggression decks. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I think this is more of like a middle ground at the moment. If you really want to go heavy, I think you can cut out an Edwin and a coin for double fan. But if you're looking to go and play against control decks, Lotheb is a very, very good option. So I think you can cut those cards and play Lotheb. Um, against some of the other control decks. Uh, I like Eviscerate, so I think that if we're trying to... Uh, uh, this is more like a middle ground for me. This is the middle ground level. Uh, the, the deck, I'm not really balancing either way. But I think that... Um, yeah, so the counterfeit coins and the Edwin are really those tech spots. So take out a coin, take out an Edwin, put two cards in. Awesome. Um you know what, Danny, thank you so much for jumping on to the episode. Um, you know, I know we have your Twitter address up here, at Danny Donuts underscore HS. Is that what it is? Um, yep. But uh, any final words you want to say to people at home or any other things you want them to check out, any podcasts or events that you... Yeah, well, um, I mean, uh, my other podcasts, uh, I have, I'm a member of Well Met. Um, and I'm also a member of Into the Wild. Uh, I got in uh, onto that podcast maybe at the beginning of this year or so. So I've been on there for five months, but not not too, too long. Uh, so yeah, those are the two things that I'm really focusing on, my podcasts as of recently. Um, always check out the any wild content from the meta snapshot people getting put out, like uh, Tempo Storm, Vicious Syndicate. Those are always, take a look at those. Uh, The guys who write that uh, for both of the reports are all really good people, all really, uh, they're good experts in their classes. Uh, They're very knowledgeable about the game, so uh, check those guys out. And uh, lastly, a shout out to Team One Trick, the rest of my team. Uh, We're actually throwing the uh, Wild Ladder Challenge number three at the moment that's currently underway in the top 30 ladder finishes for the month of may and june will qualify for our next invitational tournament when we have a i think we have a a cash money prize pool awesome great great well thank you danny it's been a pleasure having you uh those of you watching home uh you can find that king's bane deck list in the comments of the podcast or on the youtube video um and once again we will see you next week take it easy